that it hath been said, and again, just look at your cross-references if you don't trust me, but I know that you do, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Haven't you read that phrase in the Old Testament? That's a direct quote. So that would mean in some sense, maybe not 100%, but in some sense, the backdrop to Jesus' teaching has to be the Mosaic Law, not just Pharisaic adding or subtracting. In some sense, it has to be the Mosaic Law. All right, secondly up here, a summary paraphrase. Now, we've already taught you this before a few messages ago when we first began here on the oath in verse 33. This is what Lloyd-Jones said, because these are not exactly found as such in the Old Testament. That proves that he's only dealing with current events in his day. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Well, most commentators, and you can look in your Greek New Testament, and you'll find that they say this is a summary paraphrase of several different verses, perhaps from Deuteronomy 21, perhaps from Leviticus, perhaps from Exodus 20. This is not a direct quotation of the Old Testament, but it certainly could not just be restricted to the Pharisees because it very truly sums up the Old Testament. It is a very true to the Old Testament summary. And I would contrast that with our last example in verse 43 which we have studied before because we've already done love in Christian ethics. You have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor. Now that's Leviticus 19.18. He quoted Moses' law. Look at the end of this. And hate thine enemy. And you can look throughout the Old Testament. You won't find that verse anywhere. Old Testament never says to hate your enemy. Never says that. Ah, now we have a different illusion then. Part of it is to the law. In the book of Leviticus, part of it is to contemporary situations of his day, the Pharisees. The Pharisees taught that it's of God to love your neighbor, and it's of God to hate your enemy. And then what does Jesus come along doing? He doesn't come along overthrowing Moses' teaching of loving your neighbor. He comes along overthrowing the Pharisaic perversion of that, the restriction of neighbor to fellow Jews. The person whom you want to love, you consider your neighbor so that you're never guilty of a lack of love. In other words, they restricted the law. They restricted it. They didn't let it be broad as it was in the Old Testament. That neighbor, as we studied neighbor concept in Hebrew thought, included anyone who had a need. According to Jesus' teaching in the parable of the certain Samaritan in Luke 10, anyone who has a need is your neighbor, which might include your, quote, enemy, enemy from his side, not from yours. You with me thus far? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's a rather involved argument, but that's what they that's what they say. Now the second thing I want to look at here is the question of extension. The question of extension. Remember what they're saying is the backdrop is not Moses, the backdrop is the Pharisees. Jesus would not come along and overthrow the Old Testament, especially not after what he said in verses 17 and 18. He would not come and overthrow the Old Testament. They say what Jesus did is he, he took the Mosaic Law and he stood behind that, he kept that, and then he, he drew out its deeper meaning. And so what did he do for murder? Did he, did he come and do away with, with the teaching on murder? No, he's still opposed to murder. What did he do to murder? Okay, he, he clarified it to what? Anger. To anger. All right, we would agree. He took that a step further. What did he do with adultery? All right. In other words, what they're saying is, and, and we would agree with this, that the leaders of Jesus' day, they said, you can't commit adultery. The law says you can't do that, but it's all right to lust. And Jesus came showing their hypocrisy by saying, what's the difference between lust and adultery? Adultery is the act. Lust is the act in your mind. If you were in the right circumstances and the right time, you'd commit the act. The man who lusts is just as guilty as the man who commits the act. 
So we know he's talking about the Pharisees here. He doesn't do away with Moses' teaching on adultery. He stands behind adultery, but he takes it deeper. He says, if you lust, you're also an adulterer or an adulteress. Divorce. What does he do for divorce? In Matthew 5. That's Matthew 19. What did, what did the Mosaic Law teach on divorce? All right, he quotes it here. You, you can divorce, you have to write a bill of divorcement. He clarified this for why God allowed it. Is that what he really does? These first two are easy so far. He's against murder, and then the deeper principle, he's against anger. He's against adultery, that's easy. The deeper principle, he's against lust. Moses was against these two. What about divorce? That was in the law. Deuteronomy 24, you can divorce for the reason of uncleanness. Does it say in here? No, but you have to look in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. Then he comes along saying, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And the uncleanness of the Old Testament is not the same as the fornication of the New. Well, that says something different to me then. He didn't just come saying, all right, I agree with what Moses said, that if you want to divorce your wife, give her a writing of divorcement, and then I'll take that a step deeper and give you the real meaning of it. You see what I'm saying here? He didn't just say, all right, I agree with Moses. I agree with what Deuteronomy 24 said. So we're, we kind of have a question there. Let's skip over the O since that's what we're talking about. What about retaliation? That's down in verse 38. What did Moses teach? Ye have heard that it hath been said, someone takes your eye, you can take their eye. They take your tooth, you can take their tooth. That wasn't pharisaical interpretation. That was the law of Moses. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not thou away. All right, so in, or, in order to follow their analogy here that Jesus is behind everything that Moses said, we would say, all right, he allows retaliation, and then he's going to take it a step deeper. Well, he doesn't do that. B, he doesn't take it a step deeper. A, he disallows retaliation. We have a big problem on our hands then for their interpretation. What they cannot imagine in their mind is that Moses would allow O's and Jesus would come along and disallow it. They can't imagine that he would do that. Well, look, he's saying something different about divorce. Now, that's a big question. I don't want to get too far on that. This is very easy to see. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, I say to you, don't resist evil. That's very clear to see. They just can't imagine he's going to take the Mosaic Law and, as they would say, overthrow it. Put it down and put something else in its place. Then we come down here to love, and, and that's a little bit different because for the first time he actually quotes part of the Pharisees' Law, Pharisees law and hate thine enemy. This is the only one with a Pharisee quote in it. And uh, so he extends it to enemies. He extends neighbor to enemy, but that was already done in the Old Testament. He just clarifies it. In other words, our conclusion to this contextual round robin would be the obvious conclusion is that the backdrop to Jesus' discussion would be Moses and or the Pharisees. We all agree on that? Uh -huh. Can't go any further if we don't. That the backdrop to his teaching is Moses and or the Pharisees. Let's take murder, for example. What do you think the backdrop is there? Pharisees. He agrees with Moses. You can't murder. 
backdrop is, oh, they said you can't murder, but we can be angry. Adultery. Pharisees. Divorce. Probably both of those there. What Moses said, as well as pharisaical misinterpretation of some things. What about the oath? Have to be Moses to begin with. And the Pharisees, because they had all this binding, non-binding business. Moses didn't have all that. Moses just had a plain oath. But Jesus deals not only with plain oaths, but with non-binding binding, because non-binding and binding is an oath. What about retaliation? Moses, and, and, and maybe the Pharisees. You might can add the Pharisees in on several of these, because you know, they're, they're suspect on all of, this, all of these matters here. <laughs> and love... Um, well, Pharisees, because they're perverting what Moses said. He didn't come contradicting Moses. In other words, it would look pretty much something like that as far as, you know, uh, at least a surface look at this. Sometimes it's Moses. Sometimes it's Pharisees. Sometimes it's a combination of it. So that means this argument, and I don't know why they just can't get it out of their mind that Christ could actually come along and, and do away with something in the old. I mean, he did away with sacrifice and the temple and the Levites. He did away with all of that stuff. But for some reason, they can't comprehend the fact that he'd actually do away with some other teaching of Moses. Mm -hmm. We pause here before I go on. I want to make sure you understand this argument. This is one the specialists will use against us now. And, and I guess the whole thing they're concerned about is, um, well, you could express it in one of two, in two ways. They're concerned about relativism. They don't want to end up in relativism. You know what relativism is? that you make the laws of God relative to various cultures and various peoples so that sometimes it's all right to commit adultery, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can sin and be justified, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can take an oath, other times you can't. They want to steer clear of relativism. Or another name for that is situational ethics and Joseph Fletcher. We want to steer clear from that as well. That's a dangerous pitfall to into which many people have gone. Joseph Fletcher and Bishop John A.T. Robinson's situation ethics. And something else that they're concerned about is continuity. They're concerned about the continuity of the covenants. And that would be because of verses 17 and 18 of this context, Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy Moses of the prophets, I came to fulfill. They would say, but wait a minute, you just destroyed part of Moses. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. You're becoming more and more convinced now the, the correct position from these passages. It's so clear. You see how important detailed study becomes for the Christian then? Because you'll have these slippery 14-headed lying eels in theological seminaries that will say it means this and it means that. And they have a lot of fancy footwork and casuistry to use against you. They're accusing us of casuistry. They're saying what Jesus is dealing with is a casuistical deceit of the Pharisees. And they're casuistically deceiving us while they're teaching us that. There's the irony of it all. They're the ones, the very commentators are the ones using casuistry against us. <laughs> they just rearrange the scriptures to make them say what they want to say. Amen. It's like Augustine said a millennium and a half ago, if you don't believe the Bible, but l believe what you want to believe about the Bible, it's not God you follow, but yourself. Amen. If it's not the Bible you believe, but what you want to make the Bible say, it's not God you follow, it's yourself. And what they want to accuse us, us of, we call them iron hits. They call us naive simpletons because we woodenly interpret Matthew 5.34. <laughs> Pardon me while I laugh about that. I say unto you, swear not at all. And so here we little simple evangelical Christians just say, well, in our little high-pitched Sunday school voice, well, that's what Jesus said, don't swear at all. And they laugh at us, you naive simpletons. 
You don't have any theological acumen. You have the intelligence of a ballpoint pen. You should study out the passage here, and you'll see that's not what Jesus really meant. Well, we'll say, let's go a round or two then. We'll study out the passage with you. <laughs> we'll go a round or two studying out the passage. We don't have to jump to Abraham to prove our case. We'll stay right here in this passage. And remember, their weightiest argument against us thus far has been the context as well as maybe a little bit of the exegesis here. Swear not at all. And then he goes on to, they say, qualify that by four examples. And he gives four contemporary Jewish examples of heaven, earth, Jerusalem, and your head. And so what he's really saying is don't swear these, these um, ill-considered rash oaths like the Jews are doing. And yet we're just finding that ship to be as porous as a fishing net. That boat won't hold water. Not if you're going to stay faithful with the text of Scripture. Now, if your father was a Baptist pastor, I think that is the one to whom you're attempting to be faithful, not God's Word. You have a denominational heritage you're wanting to defend. Yeah. See, we don't have one. If, if I had one to defend, I'd be on the contrary position than what I am right now because I was raised in a Presbyterian church that believed in the taking of the oath. I'm not trying to defend a denominational heritage baggage that I picked up in the institutional church. Okay, with the time we've got left, let's go on and look at relational arguments then. Very similar to what we've just discussed, because the context of Matthew 5 is taking us back to the Old Testament, which then brings up the relation between the old and the new. My argument thus far is that Jesus is discussing the Jewish perversion of oaths and, and truthfulness, but he does it against the backdrop of Moses' original teaching on oath-taking. And he does that by unequivocally abolishing the oath. Here's what Barnes, the commentator, Albert Barnes, had to write in the end of last century. Goes to back to what we've been discussing uh, thus far, its relation to the Old Testament, their desire to avoid the swamp of relativism in favor of continuity. We think that's a genuine concern, to avoid relativism in favor of continuity, but we don't think that's the, that the way you go about doing that is casuistical deceit. Oaths were prescribed in the law of Moses, and Christ did not come to repeal those laws, stated in a very succinct fashion. That's their whole argument. Oaths were part of the law, and Jesus himself told us in verses 17 and 18 that he did not come to repeal those laws. See, it's like the old saying goes, if you give a man enough rope, he'll hang himself. And that's what they're trying to do to us because they know that the ultra-moralists, just by their nature, are absolutists and not relativists. And so because they know that we're absolutists, they know that we're going to have, they think that we're going to have, a big difficulty in keeping the, the laws of the old and the new absolute so that we see continuity between the two. They think that we're going to have a lot of problems in looking to the old and saying, well, now Moses prescribed that, and now Christ is abolishing that. Well. I thought that we had learned earlier that morals were absolute. They don't change in God's history. Because those types of laws are not based on some ceremonial or functional matter in Israel that's maybe relative to her civic liturgical lifestyle as the Near Eastern people. But those laws are based on the very character of God himself. Do not lie. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Those laws are based on the very nature and character of God. Those cannot change because God is a changeless God. Those are irrevocable laws. They're inviolable as far as God is concerned in any culture, in any situation, in any time. 
Lloyd-Jones again writes, I believe oaths are valid for today for several reasons. Can you believe that a man says that? I mean, Jesus just said, swear not at all. Lloyd-Jones, a famous British pastor and writer, and many American Christians read a lot of Lloyd-Jones' writings and books. Jesus said, swear not at all. Lloyd-Jones, I believe oaths are valid today for several reasons. You're going to have to have some mighty good ones, as they say. If Jesus said, don't swear, and then here, a pastor of a multi-thousand member church comes along and says, now, I believe that they are valid. What that reminds me of is, is Lloyd-Jones and other denominational leaders today are saying to us, you have heard that it hath been said by Christ, but I say unto you, and they're changing the whole law of the New Testament then. I kind of see the same parallel there. You have heard that it hath been said, don't swear, but we say unto you that oaths are still valid today. <laughs> Filthy liars. You're just snakes and serpents, according to Matthew 23. So he believes in it for several reasons. The first is the Old Testament injunction in which God laid down legislation as to how and when oaths should be taken. In other words, it's a relational thing, the relation to the new, of the New Testament to the Old. And he asked this question in conclusion. Is it conceivable that God could ever do that? That is, you know, provide legislation for the taking of an oath? If it was his will that man should never take an oath at all? See, they have big problems in with continuity. They have big problems with Malachi uh, 3, 6, I am the Lord God, I change not. Is it conceivable that God could give legislation like that if he intended that man should never take an oath? Well, we wouldn't say that he gave it intending that man should never take an oath. He gave it intending that man should in the old. He intends that man doesn't after the teaching of Christ in the life of the Lord, our Lord. So their whole argument is that Jesus only condemns rash vows, not all vows, because this would repeal the specific law of God to Moses. <coughs> there was one other thing I wanted to show you overhead. Uh, we've been dealing some with uh, D.A. Carson's writings, his commentary on Matthew, and I know that... Um, Mr. Simons back here has recently purchased that because I ordered it for him and he can um, validate and substantiate all these things I'm saying about Donald Carson. Now Carson believes that you can take the oath. He was the one who said, well, I th he said that the Apostle Paul, if we may judge from Paul's example, the oath is still allowed and God took the oath and and he lumps uh, Anabaptists and the Brethren Church and Jehovah's Witnesses together. These are the ultra-moralists, you know. And I think the last sentence in his little discussion reads like this. He's in favor of taking the oath now. The last sentence, this is a direct quote from D.A. Carson. If oaths designed to encourage truthfulness become occasions for clever lies and casuistical deceit, Jesus will abolish oaths. That's exactly what we're saying. Amen. That if oaths, which were designed to encourage truthfulness in the Old Testament through Israel's history, become occasions for clever lies and casuistical deceit, Jesus will abolish oaths. And I think, I cannot believe what I'm reading. <laughs> That's exactly what we're arguing, that it was given, designed to encourage truthfulness. It was perverted by the people, so Jesus came sweeping away swearing exactly what we're holding to this is exactly what he's opposed to this one statement here yet that's how he ends his commentary it's almost as though these two-headed people have a double conscience you know one that wants to to align itself to denominational conformity and one that feels guilty and stricken in doing that because it reads the clear teaching of Christ in Matthew 5 34 swear not at all See, we've been in this for what? I don't know, five or six messages, and we've got a long way to go. We're just going to overwhelm you with evidence here. These matters, when they're dealt with in God's word, they're clear and they're provable, especially in something as important in the teaching ministry of Christ 
as the Sermon on the Mount. Those are instructions for kingdom living, for subjects of the kingdom. And he's not going to put a lot of confusing mess in there that we can't follow or understand. <laughs> if O's designed to encourage truthfulness become occasions for clever lies. And you see, they're saying that the backdrop to Jesus' teaching here is not Moses, but the Pharisees, because of these four formulas of binding, non-binding, that what they have done with the oath is made, used it as an occasion for clever lies and casuistical deceit. That's exactly their whole argument. That's what had happened to the oath. He said, if this ever happens now, if the oath and men's truthfulness ever falls to that depth, then this is, will be the conclusion. Jesus will abolish oaths. And I'm thinking like, how long do we have to wait for that to happen? That happened centuries ago. We're still like evidently waiting for people to misuse oaths before he's going to come along and abolish it. That's what his advent, first advent, was all about. It had already fallen to that depth. And so he came along doing just what Mr. Carson says, abolishing oaths. And I, and I, thought, I, I thought the tense of this was interesting. You know, if this happens, he will do this. It already has happened, which would mean he did do that. See, he's saying the Jews have done this with, that's what he argues from, what, the end of verse 34 through 36, that they have used the oath as an occasion for clever lies and casuistical deceit. Well, the Jew, they did do that. And yet he's saying, but Christ didn't do this. In other words, he makes a contradictory statement here. If this happens, this is an if then. A protasis, a protasis. You've got your protasis. Did you want to get really technical about the whole thing? <laughs> this is a protasis, a protasis statement. Here, here's your protasis right here, and the apotasis is soon right here, which would be this word. So if you want to get into grammar and logic, he, he has made a, an absolutely flatly contradictory statement here. Here's his protasis. The protasis is the if part of a conditional sentence, and your apotasis is the then of a conditional sentence. If this happens, and you know, you know, if you say, if you love me, I'll marry you, that doesn't mean if you love me, I won't marry you. It means if you love me, I'll marry you. If it's, it, it's an if-then statement, there has to be a relationship. The very man and people who are concerned about keeping a relationship between the Old and New Testament can't even keep a relationship, can't even keep continuity in their own words. I don't know that I'm going to follow someone like that, a maniac. He's missing some marbles somewhere. He's concerned about relations and continuity and the flow of the Old and the New Testament. He can't even flow in one sentence. If this happens, then Jesus will abolish those. So, <laughs> here's his protasis, here's his apotasis, and he says, but, but I don't believe that after all, because I still believe in O's today. You'd like to get a hammer and, and wake someone up like that, but can't even think correctly. We've talked about that so often that we're losing the ability to think in this world anymore. With a steady diet, the garbage of the daily newspaper and television, you're taught formulas, you're taught cliches, you're taught complex issues and problems, all simplified, over so, oversimplified and reduced to little formulas. People can't think any longer. D.A. Carson happens to be a, a well-trained scholar, professor of theology at Trinity in Deerfield, Illinois, but Whenever you're dishonest, it's going to show through in your writing sooner or later. Amen. I don't really fault him for his qualifications. He's more than qualified. But I fault him for his dishonesty. He wants to hold to a position that is not supported by Scripture. And so he does it how? By casuistical rearrangement, by fancy footwork. Surely an average Christian is going to read that and think, wow, I don't see how that sentence makes any sense. Because he just argued in the paragraphs before that O's had degenerated to clever lies and casuistical deceit. And then he said, but Jesus didn't do away with the taking of an oath. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. But he's a scholar, so he's bound to see something that I don't see. And that's the whole thing that breaks my heart. 
that all these sheep, these dumb sheep out there say, well, he's a scholar, so he must know after all, even when what he says just flatly contradicts what he earlier said. They say, well, he's a scholar. He's a theologian. He teaches at a graduate level, so he must know what he's talking about. Well, you see, the Word of God, there's just a whole lot of people that teach at graduate level that don't have the common sense of a pack rat. For the continuation of... Well, you see, the Word of God, there's just a whole lot of people that teach at graduate level that don't have the common sense of a pack rat. You know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, that the gospel message is, is to the foolish, to the base, to the weak, to the despised. I mean, the full gospel message, the whole gospel message is for those people who will just reduce themselves, as John said, low enough, will decrease so that he can increase and so that they can have clear insight into his word. Hallelujah. Thank God we have clear insight into his word. Amen. And you know the only way you'll have clear insight is to be honest. We don't have anything we want to prove. I don't care whether O's are allowed or not allowed. It doesn't make me any difference at all. And I think we can all say that. I don't care whether Christmas is scriptural or not scriptural. I could care less. I just want to know so I can either practice it or not. Amen. I don't have something that I do want to do or that I don't want to do. But that takes grace. Amen. Takes grace. How did, you, how did you get into this walk like that? And all those other numbskulls out there just butting their heads up against the clear, solid teaching of God's word. Don't ever take that for granted, dear friends. Amen. You sit in here, well, I know that and I see that. Amen. Solely by grace that we see these things. Well, it seems easy once you get over here on this side of it. Well, just read the passage. I mean, any fool, an ox can interpret that. Well, why didn't any of us earlier in our life then? Why didn't you get sa saved two weeks before you did if this, if this was simple? Well, you knew you were a sinner all along. Salvation was in the cross. Why didn't you just go ahead and get some of it? It's just you can't do that. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you. <laughs> Let's end with three things in this evening. Really with two, but I want to say something before I say this two. So I think that equals three. Concerning this business of relation to the Old Testament, I don't want to really use that marriage and uh, divorce one. That is a difficult passage right there. I'd rather use the retaliation one. That's the clearest one, since we can't use O's, since that's a part of what we're discussing. You can't use the word that you're trying to define to define the word. Verses 38 and 39. They're saying, you know, he, he couldn't come along and do away with something in the Old Testament. Well, 38 and 39 answer that. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That is, he taught retaliation. He taught a measured form of retaliation. That it had to be just, it had to be just, a recompense that was just. What they did to you, you could do to them. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, now does he then say, then you can smite him on his right cheek. And who is he quoting in verse 38? Moses. Not the Pharisees, Moses. Now I'm sure they had some watered down views of all of this too, but he's still quoting Moses there. He didn't say if they smite you, you can smite them. He said, if they smite you, you turn the other cheek and let them smite that one also. You say, well, what are the commentators going to do with this? For You don't have to have me tell you that, do you? You know what they're going to They're going to explain this thing away as well. When I, you can't take that literally because, I mean, we've got to practice self-defense. If someone attacks you or if your country has to go to war, then, you know, you can't. There they go again. Lying, slippery eels. You can't even get a hold on these people. 
So then she's saying, but wait a minute, this is a very, I thought you said you believed in biblical inerrancy, the authority of scripture. Well, I do, but I believe in that the way I interpret that. That's what they really mean. The double talkers, the two-headed souls, you can't get a clear, uh, concise statement out of any of them. They say, yes, I believe in the authority of Christ, that what he taught is inviolable, it's absolute, it's scripture. All scripture is given it by inspiration of God. And yet they manage to wiggle their way out of some of these. Well, let's ask ourselves this question, though. How does our understanding of the oath now, Moses taught it, Jesus overthrew it. How does that square with verses 17 and 18? Back to contextual thought here. How does that square with 17 and 18? Verses 17 and 18 of Matthew 5. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Well, he's not going to contradict himself in the same sermon, and Matthew wouldn't in the same chapter. We have definitely seen with the oath and retaliation a change. So what this will boil down to, and you should see the volumes written on this, what this will boil down to is a discussion of these terms here then, to give you the English ones. <laughs> and especially this one right here, this is the big term. The Theonymous, by the way, North and Rushdoni and so forth. This is a big verse of theirs right here. Remember the Theonymous teach that the Old Testament and its civil laws should be enacted today and passed upon all the law, all the countries of the world. And they're saying, because look at here, Jesus taught himself, I didn't come to do away with the Old Testament. Therefore, if you commit adultery, what was the Old Testament law for that? Stone them to death. If you're a witch, what's the law for that? Burn them to death. And they're wanting to impose that. Well, of course, we don't believe that, and most conservative evangelical people don't believe that. So it would boil down to an argument about these words here. Well, I'll just sum it up here, and you can trust me or wait till later and we discuss this. Uh, Jesus is not destroying the law on oaths. He didn't come to destroy the Old Testament, so we would agree with that. There's no way he came to destroy that law. But what is the law on oaths about? truthfulness that's what the law is about yeah. not the oath and you have to understand that or you miss the whole import of Matthew 5 and the Old Testament's teaching Amen. the law on oath was not given just so you could take an oath it was to assure to help to guarantee to be sure it didn't totally do it truthfulness in conversation in the life of the Jewish people So he didn't come to destroy the law on the taking of oaths. He came to what? Fulfill the law on oaths. And what's the law of, on, of oaths all about? The, the, the great depth of truthfulness required in a person's life. So deep that Jesus said that your yes should, be, should mean yes and your no should be no. That's the whole heart of the law of the oath. You were to take an oath to make sure that what you said was true. So he didn't come destroying that law. He came fulfilling that law by drawing out, making explicit what was implicit in the law, by drawing out the spiritual intent of that law. And that is the doctrine, the importance of truthfulness. And he did that by saying, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. He fulfilled the law on oaths. He didn't destroy it. He came and fulfilled it. What are they going to do then with animal sacrifice in the Old Testament? They're saying, now, he didn't, he wouldn't destroy anything in the Old Testament. Well, no one believes he destroyed anything in the Old Testament. He didn't destroy animal sacrifice. What did he do? He fulfilled animal sacrifice in the cross. You can find many cases like that in New Testament theology. He didn't come to destroy any of that. Did he do away? Did he destroy the Aaronic priesthood? No, he fulfilled it in becoming the great high priest himself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
He didn't destroy any of those teachings. He came to fulfill those teachings. He didn't destroy the taking of the oath. He came and fulfilled the taking of the oath by drawing out and making explicit what was implicit in the law. And one final thing that I want to end with. One more point of consideration. If the Old Testament taking of an oath was one's righteousness, and now Jesus tells us that it would be sin to do it, has he not made morals relative? Do you remember a few weeks ago, or I think our first or maybe second message we got into this? How can it be that the Old Testament allows what the New Testament disallows? If the oath was actually, according to what one passage we looked at earlier, was one's righteousness, and now if Jesus prohibits it, it would be sin to do contrary to that, then has he not made morals relative? See, we know that sacrifice, animal sacrifice, was relative. That's not a, an absolute moral law of God. That was relative to the dispensation of the Jewish people in the old, under the Old Covenant. Animal sacrifice was relative. It was fulfilled in the great sacrifice of Christ. Murder, that was not relative. What was said about murder in the Old Covenant is still true for today. What was said about adultery in the Old Covenant is still true for today. What was said about the garments that the high priest had to wear on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament is not true for today. And it's not because God changes. God in his essence and his character doesn't change. In the way he deals with men, because men change, those laws change. Not the moral ones. They're absolute. But hasn't he made morals relative by disallowing what the Old Testament allowed? How can it be wrong in the New Testament and right in the Old? Well, we'll end with that. We'll get into that discussion Sunday morning then.
Father, we thank you for these studies you've been giving us from your word. Hallelujah. We pray that by your spirit you'll help us translate our doctrine into deeds that we'll not only have a, a correct view about this matter in your <coughs> word, but that we'll, we will be truthful people, that our yes will mean yes and our no will mean no. We praise you and we adore you. It's before your feet that we bow for your gracious condescension to us and giving us your word. Through your grace, you've made known these things to us. You've opened our eyes to see these things. You've opened our heart to be receptive to these things. You've convinced us in our intellect and in our will that it's best to follow you, that the good life is the life that, that follows Jesus Christ Amen. and his teachings. We thank you for this life that you've given us. We thank you that we can all sense that we're growing in it more and more. The more we're taught, the more we know, the more we grow. We're growing in truthfulness because we're learning more about it. It's being underscored in our mind because of the teachings from the lips of Jesus, our Lord himself. We thank you for this. That as you overthrew the false doctrines of the religious leaders in your earthly ministry, that you give us your spirit to do the same today. We pray that we'll have the same heart that you have, a heart of love, but a heart of contempt for the people that blaspheme your word and contradict your word. As David, your servant, said, I hate all of your enemies with a perfect hatred that will love people, but will hate the deception that they're in, the people that they're leading astray by their degrees, by their false teaching. We just rejoice the fact that we can relax in your presence, enjoy a full salvation, a full redemption, because we know your word. Thank you for your spirit, the one who enlightens our hearts, illuminates the word to our minds. In Jesus' name.